and welcome to episode 11 of AMEB's Break the Isolation webinar series. Um, this episode is Keeping Indigenous Language Alive Through Song uh, with Candice Kruger. Before we begin, um, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders both past and present. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Candice. Um, and thank you to everybody out there who's joining online. Uh, my name is Stephen Hodgson and I'm the Head of Publishing at AMEB. For today's webinar, I'm joined by Candice Kruger, an educator, choral director, PhD candidate, and Yugenbeer Yarabilgingen, or Yugenbeer Songwoman, I hope I haven't murdered that uh, okay. pronunciation too badly, um, and a proud Copper Mary and Noogie Aboriginal woman. Welcome, Candice, and thank you so much for joining us today. Jingri, um, Baohu Yawen, hello and good afternoon, everyone. It is wonderful to be here, and it's um, I'm on country on the Gold Coast. Um, it's a little bit cloudy today, and you can actually see the cloud coming across my face, I think, a little bit with the light, but it is um, Yabru Kubu, a beautiful day here. Uh, that's lovely. It's, it's not too bad in Melbourne, and I hope everybody else is enjoying the weather too. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. So, Comba Mary, um, tell me about Comba Mary. So, I'm a Comba Mary Noogie woman down my father's line, and I have European heritage on my mother's line. So, Comba Mary are the people of the Gold Coast, Southport, Narang, um, sitting within the Yugambeh language region of the Gold Coast, Logan, and Scenic Rim. And the Yugambeh language region is really quite well known in Southeast Queensland, as well with the works of the Yugambeh Museum that have been going on for well over 35 years, um, underpinned by the Comba Mary Aboriginal Corporation for Culture, which my family, along with many other family lines, helped establish. Um, and then Nugi on um, also dad's dad's line because my father, um, my father's grandparents were a traditional marriage line of Kumba Mary Southport Narang and Nugi of Morton Island and Morton Island sitting within the Kondamuka people of Stradbroke and Morton Island over there. So yeah, that's who my family are and down my dad's side. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so Yugambe is the is the language region and that incorporates um, a, a number of different groups and, and, and family groups. Um, and the Comba Mary is, is the Gold Coast specific region um, and, and Noogie is the Morton Island specific yes. region, but all within the Yugambeh language well, area. So over, over on Strawberry Island, we actually have um, Jandai and um, Goa is one of the very, very old Noogie languages. But at this, for, for quite some time, I've worked within the Yugambeh language region. It's been a language that's been a little bit more forward progressed than other Aboriginal languages. So that's the one I've been working with at this point in time. That's, that's great. Thank you so much for that. Um, there are so many uh, facets to your very fascinating career. Uh, it's very hard to know where to start. So um, as a starting point, I thought I'd like to bring up uh, the Yugambeh Tauga book that you wrote back in two, 2005. You co-authored Yugambeh Tauga, Music Traditions of the Yugambeh People. So Yugambeh is the, is the language group. How did you become involved in that project? How did that all start? So 2005 was the moment that it was published, but it was actually started in the mid 90s. Um, I had not long um, finished a, um, a music degree in uh, about 94, 95, something like that, up at QUT and in Brisbane. And um, the elders approached me. So the two elders on that book, Patricia O'Connor, who went and met the Queen with the Commonwealth Games, and your soul of best, her sister who has passed now, um, spoke to my grandfather, Sam Living, and said, you know, it's time for her, she, she knows Western music, it's time for her to go and um, talk to elders and collect some of the songs and do that. So they found a little bit of federal funding, just a tiny little bit, it wasn't very much, but I... Um, went out with introductions from, from elders to talk to people. And specifically, I took, uh, the first person I spoke to was um, my grandfather's sister, Lottie um, Lavinge. And Lottie helped me with a narrative and told me a few other people to go to. The Yugamem Museum collected some information as well and old newspaper articles. And that, that was the moment that I started. And I didn't really realise it was the moment that I was beginning the journey of a song woman as I was really told to do. And I, and I was told to do it. And I just went and did it because it was, you know, there must be something really important. I didn't know that it was important when I was in my early 20s. But, you know, 
how wonderful that I had that opportunity. And then fast forward, the, the museum published that manuscript along with some other information that, that um, Patricia and Yasola had gathered in 2005. So fresh, fresh out of uni, yeah. you were told to go and collect the songs of the Yugambe area. That's quite an undertaking for somebody so young and, and so fresh out of, out of training. Well, um, I've recent, I'll, I'll just jump in there, Steve. I've recently discovered that um, when I was in year 11, uh, so the elders and my father went and gathered and had a, a language summit to actually um, talk about the language that they knew. And it was at that point in time that there was um, an ethnomusicologist that was in the area and asking them for song material. And they said, no, 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 we don't have any songs to give you. And it wasn't that they didn't have songs, that they just didn't want to hand over their knowledge to someone they didn't know. And, and it was because I was reading um, Gamal's work and, and recognised that narrative of what she said and then um, speaking to my father about, because he was at at that summit point in time, he said, no, we were just waiting for you. So it was really a wonderful moment that they'd realised that they could pass song, but they wanted to pass it to someone who was their own. Absolutely. So, Which yeah. is, you know, completely understandable. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, uh, musicology, when you're, when you're working with traditional songs like this, um, we, we can't go through big underground archives of, of um, frail manuscripts or anything like that. How, how do you collect these songs? How does that all work? Well, there's a couple of different ways. So um, Trove, I get lost in Trove for those of us that know Trove for hours and hours on the end, looking for little snippets of information that might actually allude to a narrative that I'm looking for. Um, some songs were recorded by uh, Gresty in the 1940s. He was a forestry worker in the Numbar Valley. And he wrote down that here are some nonsensical children's songs. Well, we can look at the Yugambeh language lists and actually decipher what those songs mean now. And But he said maybe it felt like it was sung a little bit like Ring a Rosie or something else. So he's put his interpretation down, which means that I can actually, um, in some ways, I've been able to lend the song a melody so that we can keep that song line alive. There have been a couple of songs that have been passed down generations. So we sing one song in particular, um, Call to Corbury and it's um and it means you you come here you come here now and it's calling everyone to come into Corbury that was actually passed down by a family who lived near a borough ground in Logan for 90 years on a piece of paper and the family sung it to each other and a European family and then they walked in and handed it to the Yukamir Museum and said, this is what our family collected and we knew one day we'd hand it over. So it's it's songs like that, it's um, stories, it's also going and speaking to elders. So, you know, one, one particular story, I'll, I'll hear something, so I'll go and speak to other elders and they'll say, oh, I knew that, but I didn't really realise that you wanted to know that piece of information. And, and then that's, it, it's awakening memories as well as it is finding and, and searching for song lines. So really, really painstaking work and, and so uh, reliant on relationships with, yeah. with elders and with, with various different people around the place who would have no musical training necessarily. Right. They don't really know, um, you know, what, what they've got, uh, what, what really precious resources they've got um, from songs that they remember from their childhood. And it's about digging those, digging those out and then, and then finding that several different people have remember the same songs probably slightly differently yeah. and working out how how that all works so it's it's you know it's musicology but it's also anthropology and also family it, it is and you know i don't choose to look at songs anymore and aboriginal music as um traditional and contemporary because we can't really draw draw that line i i look at things aboriginal music as what was, what is, and what will be, you know, the past, the present, and the future. And, and, and what narrative it's actually telling us? Is it telling us the story of the land? You know, we sing, um, when, when, come on, are you? Well, it's actually a call and response. So we, are, we know that that's a Western style call and response, but what it gives us is the grannies calling out to the children, 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 where are you? And the children call back, well, we're collecting grubs, granny. And even though you think that that's about collecting grubs, 
when you go and sit down with Arnie Rose Knott, who's on Strawberry Island, Arnie Rose will tell me that actually that's an entire narrative of when we had to cap, um, row our boats across to McIntosh Island here on the Gold Coast. And then we had to walk all the way down to the beach and we had to um, fish and collect the yugaris. Most people know them as pippies, but the Aboriginal word is yugari. And collect the yugaris and then you eat certain parts of it. And then you go and collect, strip the bark back from the trees and collect the grubs. And so all of a sudden, just in two small lines of the song, we have a whole food source narrative. And so we have to put all of that together and understand what all of these songs mean. So we're really lucky that the elders actually are able to, once they have a song, then tell us where it's going. Absolutely. It's, it's such a, a complex um, and integrated uh, discipline to, to try and work, work through all of these stories and, um, and dig up, you know, memories and, and dig up recordings and, and bring them all together. I, I think it's absolutely amazing. Um, so as well as, as being working as a musicologist, really, um, you, you identify as a song woman or you, you've been given the term song woman. What, what does that mean? Tell, tell us what, what that means. Um, I, I probably have always done the work of a song woman, um, but it's been, which is gathering and collecting and passing on some knowledges, but it's only been more recently that I, um, you know, have said, to, like some people have said, oh yeah, Candice is our song woman. And so I've gone to elders and gone, are you calling me a song woman? They're going, you've been our song woman for a really long time. You've been the person that has been not only gathering the song sources back together, a bit of jigsaw puzzling as well for community, but because I established the Even Bear Youth Choir, I'm passing these whole pieces back together, not the fragments, the whole pieces, and I'm passing them on to our youth. They don't even know that these songs were ever in fragments. They just know them as, as the narrative, the land's language, and here is the song that helps keep it alive. And they don't know what you're doing behind the scenes to, to be able they to offer that to them. them. I do tell them how much hard work it is when they say, oh, Miss Candice, can we have another song? And I go, well, give me a minute to find one or write one. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's absolutely amazing. So obviously, you know, I, I don't know much about the, the traditional role of a song woman or song man, but I imagine it's, it's part of uh, partly keeping the law, keeping the, the songs um, to, to disseminate as, as necessary, making sure everybody's performing them correctly. Is that, is that along the right lines? So I have long conversations with elders and um, have, have worked through, I guess people call it the ethics of songs, but I call it the processes and protocols and cultural knowledge and what can we share and when can we share it and what's appropriate and how would these songs be best performed? So I spend a lot of time talking to elders to make sure that, that happens and I'm really really happy to do it because I'm incredibly passionate about this and that this needs to happen for our community and then the kids also then um, the judge and beautiful beautiful children all I tell them I've sat down with Arnie so-and-so or uncle or whoever and this is what they have said about this song and we can perform it in this context and then um, the work that I'm working on now as part of my doctoral studies is actually because I'm a music classroom music teacher and have done that for a very long time, many of my colleagues have said, well, we've seen the work that you've done and we know the songs, but how can we perform them? So what I'm working through right now is the permissions from elders um, and the protocols that are already done for music educators so that people can, not only can we publish a song that, that people can perform as part of their classroom music program or in a concert or just to learn for themselves, but they also have the permission's already given them to them to move forward to present at a conference or to present at a concert or, or um, just perform within community. And that's, that's that next step of where I'm heading. Wonderful. Song woman for all of Australia. Or so. <laughs> well, the world, really. Um, so this ties into your, your current research. Yes. Uh, you're, you're currently sitting for a PhD at Griffith University, I believe. Yes. Um, so what, what, uh, what is the framework for that? So um, I hadn't intended to do a PhD. I hadn't studied in a very long time. And so I actually approached the university because I started the Even Bear Youth Choir um, in 2014. And I was actually able to see that there were benefits afforded to Aboriginal children when they sang in Aboriginal language. And so um, I approached the university to do a little study on that. And I did a Masters of Arts research 
um, thesis in the Bora Ring Yubin Bear Language and Song Project and actually um, wrote up about the five benefits that Aboriginal children are afforded when they sing in Aboriginal languages like um, youth leadership, um, language acquisition, identity, Aboriginality, um, sociocultural capital and well-being. So we talked about all of those things and, the, and it was the children's voice, it, they were the ones that were telling us um, the amazing things about finding songs that were attached to their families and they felt it in their bloodstream. That was really quite amazing. And so then when I finished that, it was uh, music educators, that's when the conversation started on, well, Candy, can we please have songs to sing in our classroom? Can we please have this information? And so it, it's actually taken me, um, you know, a good two and a half, three years to work through what that would look like. And, and that's where we're at now. And so hopefully by the end of this year, fingers crossed, um, we, <laughs> we'll have, uh, yes, uh, several songs that will be published with protocols um, ready to go. But to do that, I've had to found the Yugan Bay Youth Aboriginal Corporation to ensure another part of this step as well, that um, there might be some songs that I've written, you know, so I retain ownership of those, but those songs that are in collective knowledges, how do, if there's a book that's going to be sold, how do the profits from all of that come back to a community and remain within the community? So that's all part of the work that I've had to do along this process as well. Really, really a, um, a way of working in, in which the, the people that own the song and the, and the, the families who, who have inherited these very precious songs um, get their fair share and, and, yes. and benefit from, from these very precious things that they're putting out into the world. But added to that, the elders um, on country here are, are so thoughtful of not just direct descendants of their family lines, but of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders children that live on country. So within Yugan Bay Youth Choir, um, as long as the kids identify as being Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, they're welcome to join the choir, which I have volunteered for, for since 2014. I'm just a community volunteer. I think it's incredibly important to give music education when you know it. Um, and I've been able to give the gift to my community and gather the song lines. And so I just started as who wanted to join me out of, out of interest. And I have amazing families that, that turn up and come along. And so it's a part of um, these songs and narratives need to give back to all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in the community. And so that's what elders have said that they want. So when, when was it that you formed the choir formally? When did that all... Um, so, well, I was a little bit inspired. I was able with colleagues to go to the World Choir Games in 2012. And when we were there, um, I just had a school, we had a school choir that we took over. But um, in the, at the end of 2011, um, the Yugan Bear Museum formally translated the national anthem into Yugan Bear language and, ha and it was formally handed to the Queensland um, Parliament. And um, so we took that as a song to sing just on our, the friendly concerts that we sang at and it was incredibly well received. And so when I was also there, I did a little bit of professional development and um, I actually saw children from China singing in Mandarin and I saw children from different African nations singing in different languages. And I just had that epiphany moment that, well, I know songs, why am I not teaching Aboriginal children to sing in the Aboriginal language of the songs that I know? So um, I came home and um, with the assistance of the Yugan Bear Museum was able to um, find a space and I just said, I'm just going to be sitting here on a Friday, who wants to join me? And for the, in 2014, I think for the first few months, I sat there on my own, one person joined me, we had a great time. And then um, a few handful of more children joined me and by 2015, I maybe had about somewhere between 13 to 15 kids and then we were at, then we were invited to sing um, at the Indigenous All Stars because the one thing we could do really well was the national anthem in Yugan Bear language. <laughs> we got there, yay, we had something. And they were able to do the call, um, the, uh, another song called The Wedding Song and they were also able to do um, the call to um, calling the children like I sang the way the Marvel just before. And we just had these three little songs and um, all of a sudden we were singing the national anthem beside Christine Anu and off it went. We were... Um, invited to sing in so many different places and we have performed at amazing venues with some mega music superstars and the kids have been really lucky. Well it's it's such an amazing undertaking so it, it's a youth choir and really the main mission is to sing in Yugamea in, in yeah. sing in language and bring uh, kids who, who whose background is from that region um, mm -hmm. together to sing in the language of that region. 
Oh, well, no, I've just got kids that live here on country that might be from somewhere else. They might be Camilleroy kids or um, Durag kids, and that's absolutely fine. I think the most important thing is that song is the vehicle for learning the language and learning the narrative, and that's how we work. And added to that, those kids that actually have a language region from somewhere else, um, they may have been raised here or always lived here or moved here, they learn to sing Yugen there, and then if we're counting, if we're just going um, yabru bula bula yabru bula bula dung dun, and we're singing counting one to five, it makes them go, I wonder what one to five is in Camilleroy language or in Darug language, and then they begin to ask those wider questions about, I want to know it for myself too. And I've even had kids come back and go, I have found out what kookaburra means in my language, and I just go, that's so exciting. So there's many facets and reasons why we do this. It's it's really impressive and, and no surprise that you've had so much interest um, around Australia and so, uh, especially in, in the Gold Coast region and um, yes. doing all sorts of amazing things. What, what have been some of the high points? Um, we, uh, one of our biggest champions is Justice Philippides of the Supreme Court and we got to sing in the Supreme Court and then we're invited to a closed high court um, courtroom to perform. So as much as, yes, we've sung at the closing ceremony of the Commonwealth Games with Archie Roach and the kids have had a great time, that one was really fascinating and the kids uh, adored that they got to have this tour of the Supreme Court and the High Court and actually see the inner workings of uh, what goes on um, within the, the landscape of the world that they live in. Um, we were meant to go to the um, International Society Music Education Conference in Helsinki, Finland later this year, but unfortunately with COVID that's been cancelled, but that would have been an amazing highlight and our first step outside of Australia. We haven't toured or sung outside of Queensland yet, but that is um, something that we need to begin to do. Um, yeah, I mean, such a tragedy and, and it would have been such a great experience for, I mean, Touring as a as a young kid with a music group is is just such a, a sensational experience. And oh, the Yugen, oh, sorry, sorry. The Yugen Bear Youth Choir is actually I'll take them the second that they enter prep, so they're five, and they go all the way through to twenty six. So when we talk about youth leadership, we actually have a structure within choir, very informal structure. But the older kids help the younger kids, and even those kids that are between twelve and fourteen, um, they help out as well. So we have this sort of hierarchical structure that the, the judge and the children have worked out themselves and how they help each other. And it's some of the most amazing thing is to watch, um, you know, an 18 year old fella grab who sings beautifully and is really proud of his culture and singing, but pick up or take the hand of a six or an eight year old boy to walk on stage to make sure he feels comfortable or a little girl to make sure they feel comfortable. And we have this right through both boys and girls of all ages, um, who then, once they step out of choir, you know, once they head off to university or into life, what are they doing when school's finished, they come back to go, can I help with this? Or what do you need? Or how can I talk about what choir has done for me and made me feel comfortable as an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person in community? Such an amazing experience and, and such an opportunity to Get some leadership skills um, yes. at an early age and, and yes. have those moments where they're responsible for other people who are younger, yes. younger than them. Um, look, we're, we're getting close to the end, so I, I, I should um, probably ask you some of the questions that have come through. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, it went so, so very quickly. Um, so, of course, this is uh, National Reconciliation Week and this, this webinar, uh, it, it, is partly inspired by that. Um, what does, I mean, wh how do you feel about National Reconciliation Week? What, what does that mean to you? I'm, I am working towards a reconciled Australia. And while there are so many people that do that on so many different levels, and there are still um, issues to be addressed in Australia, I can at least step up and do my part. And stepping up and doing my part is ensuring that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children know the narrative and can sing it through song on the country that they live in. I can then go, how can I assist um, others to learn the song lines of, of the country that, that is here as well, this jargon. And um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm working towards. My own path in reconciliation is reconciling it through music. And what better form, um, what better format than music to, to yeah. reach out? I agree. Um, 
what is the painting behind you? Can you tell us anything about that? Oh, um, that is very, very old. And it's actually pretty big because you can see my piano behind as well. Uh, so that's um, a Central Australian artwork. And I, um, my parents, when I was 16, so in, in the late 80s, they owned um, an Aboriginal arts and craft shop at Century Cove on the Gold Coast, helping Indigenous artists to actually um, yeah, make some money with their art and, and, and showcase art. And that one um, comes from uh, Central Australia somewhere, I think. Uh, the artist is written on the back. I can't remember. I haven't had to talk about it in a really long time. But it is a very old, beautiful artwork. I have yeah. one. Mm. Starting. Um, uh, another couple of questions. We've, we've spoken a little bit about the song of uh, the role of song woman or song man um, a little bit earlier in the webinar. Um, but, uh, you know, your role has, has taken on a, a more, a, a completely different flavour because, of course, you're, uh, as well as keeping the songs and, and um, teaching the songs, you have to reconstruct the songs. Uh, and so that's a, a completely different or a, a new level and a new layer, uh, even beyond the traditional, very important role of the song woman and song man. Um, another uh, question that's come through, do you, do you play any instruments? Oh, Apart so I, um, let the uh, so I did the flute at university. I'll play the piano sometimes pretty badly. <laughs> I do play the piano and have accompanied choirs and um, I'm not a trained singer. I'm, I trained as a choral teacher and instrumentalist um, and classroom teacher. So uh, for those, uh, there's a few musicians out there that know me. Um, so I have worked around Australia as a classroom primary school music teacher and then secondary. So um, yeah, there was a point in time I was a director of music at Knox Grammar Preparatory School in Sydney. I worked at Prince Alfred College in Adelaide, taught in the Queensland education system. Um, I've, I've been teaching classroom music for over 22, 23 years and, and um, assisting. But yeah, I primarily trained on the flute. That's where I began. You're a flautist. Wonderful. Um, so uh, what is your role currently? You, you still work within schools as, on top of everything else you do. What is your role? I do. So... Um, I, I'm actually lucky that um, I've been able to work part time at the moment with so that I can finish my PhD off uh, with Griffith, but I'm currently the head of Department of Indigenous Education at Beenley State High School. So that's a school up in Logan where we have over 13% of the students are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander in high school. And so whilst I am able to actually teach the school choir how to sing the anthem in Yugambeh language and work with Yugambeh songs with the school choir and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students that are there, I'm also able to help the kids graduate school and find a pathway after school as to what they would like to do. Wow, that's, that's really impressive. Um, what sort of challenges do you help uh, Aboriginal students meet, Indigenous students um, meet? Look, some of it is actually connection to culture um, and um, identity and Aboriginality and knowing who you are. And then there are other kids who have amazing strong culture and it could just be um, helping with math and English. So there, there, are, there are various needs and, um, and also working with the staff that are there and helping them to embed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives into the classroom. And I have to say, Beenley State High School teachers do it really well. That's, that's absolutely amazing. Um, look, we, we are almost out of time. Um, the Yugambe Youth Choir has had a bit of an association with AME, AME, AMEB over the years um, on various different things. But one of the things that you've helped us out with a lot um, is our online orchestra, which has run 2018 and 2019. Um, and we just wanted to say a little bit about a project that we've, that's coming up. Um, AMEB Online Orchestra is taking a bit of a break this year and next year we'll be returning in full force. Um, and we'll be working with Candice uh, on, uh, on the Online Orchestra song for that year. Um, and Candice has very generously and, and skillfully um, started writing a, a, a piece for that based on uh, a traditional song which was heard by one of your relatives. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Do you want me to say what it's called? Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> 
So um, the very first one, that I, and I alluded to it earlier, actually, one of the very first songs that um, one of my aunties told me was Morning Star and Evening Star. And so Auntie Lottie told me this and she had known it as a child and it had been sung to her a lot. And I've always wondered what we would do um, with this piece of music and, and uh, where it would go. And I've been able to talk to family and um, work with Land Living, my cousin, and um, we are working towards having the narrative in song and English and language and working with Amy B to see uh, what we can do with this piece of music. And so it, it is great excitement to us here in the community. I know it will be to the Yuba Baby Choir as well. Well, it's great excitement from us as well. We've, it's such an opportunity and we're so grateful for, for you for helping make this happen. Well, make this happen. Um, we will be telling more about this project in the coming months and it, it will be properly launched uh, a little bit later in the year but I didn't want to miss this opportunity to, to hear a few words about it. Um, look, I think that's we've got uh, all. Uh, I think that's all we've got time for today. Um, and sorry if we haven't got to your sp a particular question, but I hope you found uh, the questions that we did get to uh, illuminating. Thank you so much, Candice, for sharing uh, these amazing bits of information about yourself and about your work and there's just so much there we we touched the tip of the iceberg um but hopefully we'll hear lots more from you um and, and people will be able to get to know about the amazing work that you're doing um in the coming years months years uh, decades um thank you very much to our team behind the scenes who have been uh feeding through questions as they come up especially alana alana um, and finally, thank you so much to everybody who's logged in uh, to listen or take part in the conversation. Please check out our Here to Help webpage for a list of resources and ideas to keep you going throughout this period of working from home or not, depending on where in the country you are. Um, and we have some great webinars planned for the coming weeks. The next one is on Tuesday, June the 2nd with George Torbay talking about musical theater. Um, so thank you all again. Uh, especially Candice, but thank you everybody who attends, uh, who has attended, and um, we hope you're having a wonderful week. Have a one, you. Thank you.